This morning's scripture reading comes from the book of Nahum, chapter 1 and verse 7. I'll be reading out of the New King James. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. I always like to kneel down and pray one more time before I open the word with you, so if you'll bow your heads. Lord God, Father in heaven, thank you for your inspired word. It's, uh, it is the light, the truth, that which uh, brings life to us in our broken state. Uh, not everything in the Bible is easy to swallow, though, and so I just pray, Lord, that uh, as we study from um, words about your wrath, <laughs> that you help us to see your love in your wrath. This I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. I heard about this couple who lived in snowy Chicago. How many of you have ever lived in or near Chicago up in Michigan or Illinois up there? Yeah, I know some of you have been up there. It it gets a lot of snow. Uh, By about midwinter, you're itching to, to see anything other than the white stuff. Uh, So there's this family that was up in Chicago, and they decided they were going to get a reprieve from the cold, snowy winter, and they were going to get down to Florida. Unfortunately, the husband and wife worked kind of weird schedules, and they weren't going to be able to go together. They were going to go on vacation, but the husband was going to go one day in advance, and then the wife was going to come the next day because she had to fulfill some duties. So um, once he gets down there to Florida, he begins to write an email back to his wife. And um, unfortunately, as he sends the email, he uh, mistyped her email address, left off one letter, and it went to someone else. There was a woman, meanwhile, there was a woman in Houston, an older woman. She had just buried her husband. He was a man of God and uh, a man who uh, she loved dearly. Um, It was just shortly after the funeral service that she came home to read her emails, and she expected to see, you know, letters of condolences from her friends and family. But instead, she sees the email from the man in Florida. And it says, to my loving wife, from your husband, I arrived. I've just arrived and have been checked in. Everything is prepared and ready for your arrival as well tomorrow. (laughs) Looking forward to seeing you then. P.S. It sure is hot down here. Of course, it's an apocryphal story to make a point, but I'm continuing now this uh, sermon series through the Minor Prophets, and and I've begun to realize why the Minor Prophets are the least read books in the Bible. It's because they all, there's a theme throughout all of the Minor Prophets, and the theme is judgment in all of them. (laughs) But you begin to think, well, why is the theme judgment in all of the minor prophets? Well, think about this for a second. God is trying to reach his wayward people, both both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, and he knows that his covenant is about ready to come to an end with them. And he's calling out to them uh, uh, through one prophet after another, after another, saying, come back to me. I I want to continue the covenant. I want to love you. I want to be in relationship with you. But time after time... They reject him until finally he does end that covenant. And if you think about it, um, the experience of what's going on in, in the stories of the minor prophets is actually not that far different than our time. We believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon, which means that we also stand during a time of judgment where God is also giving his last call. As he gave his last call to his covenant people in the Old Testament, so now he's beginning that last call to his people, the New Testament Christians, believers of today. And if you think about it, of any time in world history, now is the most poignant time to give that last warning. Now actually is a time where God is calling out for warning and judgment and even, yes, condemnation. So we're studying this book of Nahum. It's only three short chapters. The entire book is about the condemnation of Nineveh, but we'll come to that in a shortly. Let's explain firstly, who is Nahum? Well, 
The meaning of Nahum actually means comfort or consolation. Um, It's interesting that the entire book is about destruction and condemnation, but if you think about it, in some ways the destruction of Nineveh actually is comforting to God's people because Assyria, Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, and Assyria was that nation which repeatedly abused and destroyed God's people. And so, in some ways, not that we're happy to see somebody else destroyed or hurt, but when the person who was killing you is no longer killing you, that's reason to rejoice. Nahum chapter 1 verse 15 actually gives that implication. It says, Behold, upon the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. And yes, it was peace for Israel. Well, at least... Israel had already been destroyed by Judah, but it was peace for the southern kingdom of Judah because they were no longer being destroyed. It says, they published peace. Keep your feasts, O Judah. Fulfill your vows, for never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. It is good news or consolation, as the word Nahum suggests. And if you think about the final destruction of sin and wickedness, technically that is good news as well. Not for those who are destroyed in hellfire, but it is good news that sin is removed from the planet. It is good news that sin is removed from the universe, that God's name is cleared, and that righteousness only will dwell thereafter. That is good news. So Nahum's job is to bring this news to the people who lived in Nineveh the news of condemnation. But first it talks about who Nahum is. It says in chapter 1, verse 1, an oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of vision of Nahum of Elkosh. Well, that's very interesting because people can't figure out where Elkosh is. There was no city of Elkosh. Uh, People have come up with all kinds of different ideas, but the most likely idea is that there's a city which was called Elkesi, which is in between Jerusalem and Gaza. And so we think most likely that Nahum is from there. But I need to go through a little bit of timeline because if you understand the timeline of events of what led up to Nehemiah and what was going on in Assyria, then you'll ma- it'll make more sense why God has brought um, this condemnation on, on Assyria. So Jonah, I preached about Jonah three weeks ago. And you, if you remember, Jonah was also a prophet to the nation of Assyria. He went to the capital city, Nineveh, and he went through the whole city saying, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. And, and they all repented, right? You remember the story of Jonah? That happened in 760 BC, 760 BC. But apparently their repentance didn't last long because after only about 20 to 30 years, they were back attacking Israel again. But God allowed it because Israel was in apostasy. And in 722, the Assyrians completely and utterly destroyed the northern kingdom. They destroyed all of the capital city of Samaria. And they took majority of the people away as slaves to other areas. Uh, Assyria was the most powerful nation in the world at that time. And um, it was only about 20 years later in 701 BC when Assyria besieged Uh, Jerusalem. And so after they already destroyed the northern kingdom, they were on their way to destroying the southern kingdom. If it wasn't for a special prayer of King Hezekiah and the few faithful that lived in Jerusalem and Judah, God would have allowed destruction there too. But instead, God sent a destroying angel to kill 185,000 people of the Assyrian army and saved his capital in Jerusalem. It was only 40 years later that Nahum begins his prophecy against that kingdom of Assyria. So you understand the history, God sent a prophet already to Nineveh, they repented for a short time, they went back and did the same things they were doing before, and so God now sends a second prophet to them. The first prophet was in 760 BC, the second prophet was in 660, 100 years later, or thereabouts. Nahum's prophecy And it's very interesting because during that time, 660, it was during the time of the reign of Ashurbanipal, and he was the most powerful uh, king that ever ruled the Assyrian army. It was the time whenever their their kingdom was the greatest. It was the zenith of their power, okay? They had conquered Babylon during that time period. They had conquered uh, Samaria. They had conquered most of the 
Well, not most of the then known world. Babylon was significantly more powerful than them. But during that time, there was no, they were the world's superpower, bar none, very clearly. And here comes a humble prophet of God saying, that kingdom is going to be wiped out the face of the planet. And frankly, most people didn't believe. <laughs> they said, this is a world superpower. How can you say that? This is the world's superpower, the most powerful nation in the world, the one that nobody could withstand. But the prophecy came true only 50 years later. Babylon overthrew the Ninevites and destroyed their nation and completely destroyed all of the Assyrians. That happened in 612 BC. That's the timeline. That's the timeline of events. But you have to understand the amazing power and strength of Nineveh. The population of just the city alone, and this was, by the way, 100 years prior, Jonah said, at least God said to Jonah, that 120,000 people lived in the capital city. As far as um, cities go in ancient times, that was probably one of the most populous cities um, in ancient times. 120,000 people seems like nothing compared to you know, like Gwinnett County, which is larger than that. But in that time, that was a very, very populous region, a very populous city. And uh, so if you think about it, Jonah also described the width of the city of Nineveh. It says in Jonah chapter 3, verse 3, it says, So Jonah arose and he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. Now some people say it was three days journey from where he lived. Other versions say it was three days journey in breadth, meaning it took three days to walk across the city. Um, most translations translate it as three days journey in breadth. And I think that's probably the accurate teaching because some people say it was at least 60 miles in perimeter or 60 miles across, one or the other. Uh, so clearly if it was 60 miles across, that's, uh, that's a long, long walk. Three days, that's 20 miles a day. That's uh, making good time. So this is a massive city. Apparently, accordingly, the walls of the city were 100 feet tall and so thick you could ride three chariots side by side over the top of the walls. And they had along the walls at the corners and at different midpoints throughout, they had uh, watchtowers and each of the watchtowers were 100 feet taller than the walls. So the watchtowers were 200 feet above ground level. So this was a massive fortress and it was thought to be impregnable. What happened to this city? Well, first you have to realize the context. It was known to be extremely wicked. Nahum chapter 3 verse 1 says, Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey. Again in verse 19 of the same chapter it says, For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil, speaking of the city of of Nineveh. It was known to be one of the most evil places in the world, if not the most evil place in the world. And so what happened to the evil city? Well, the Tigris River ran through the city, and the Tigris River overflowed. It flooded terribly one year, and it damaged the wall. And so the Babylonians used that point to get in to the fortress and destroy the city. This was all, of course, all of course predicted by Nahum some 50 years in advance. He specifically says that it would come by a flood. In Nahum chapter 3, verse 7, God begins to describe his wrath against Nineveh. It says, And all who look at you will shrink from you and say, Wasted is Nineveh! Who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? And the entire book is essentially... Uh, prophecy against the destruction of Nineveh, and a description of God's wrath against Nineveh. And that's very peculiar because if you think about it, you're like, wait a minute, just 100 years prior, God said to Jonah, why can't you have grace on these people? I'm willing to forgive them. Why aren't you willing to forgive them? And then 100 years later, he says, grace is done. What changed? <laughs> what changed between Jonah and Nahum? What changed in the 150 years from the time that Jonah was a prophet to the day that they were completely and utterly destroyed? The first time? Well, we know what changed. The first time, 
They were given a chance for repentance, and they sought repentance. The second time, there was no repentance. In fact, they were not asked whether they would seek repentance or not. They were destroyed. The first time they got a prophet in person that walked, walked through the city for 40 days saying, in 40 days the city will be destroyed. The second time they just got a letter from a prophet saying, your city is going to be destroyed. God has judged you. This brings a lot of questions, you know? <laughs> like, I mean, so a lot of questions come to my mind about God's methods. The first question is, why did God save them only to destroy them? <laughs> Why did God save them only to destroy them? Question number two is, why didn't they get a prophet in person the second time? Perhaps they would have turned if there was another Jonah. The truth is, the answer is always, God knows best. <laughs> you ever say that to your kids? Kids, my kids are constantly asking questions, you know, but dad, why this, why that? Um, and, and frankly, whether it's a shortness of time or whether it's uh, my impatience or whether it's because their mind is not fully capable of understanding the ramifications and the complications of these details, sometimes the answer is because I know better. Because daddy said so. And, and, I, and I usually don't like to give that answer. I actually usually try my best to give very accurate reasoning why. Because I don't want my kids to think that I'm arbitrary. Unless I am arbitrary, I suppose. <clears throat> and there's probably times that I am. But the reality is, is that there's usually a good reason. There's usually a good reason. And the thing is, God doesn't always, our daddy, our heavenly daddy, doesn't always explain the reason. Sometimes the reason is because daddy said so. And, and in, Christians wrestle with that. There's so many people that are not okay with that. My, my kids <laughs> dislike the answer because daddy said so. But at the end of the day, they trust daddy. They trust that daddy's desires are for their best good. And, and at the end of the day, we need to look to God and say, God, I don't understand. <laughs> I know your answer is daddy said so. I don't fully grasp it right now, but I trust you. I trust your love. I trust that you're a good God and that you're fair and righteous. The reality is God already knows whether they are going to repent or not before he sends a prophet. God already knew that they would repent before he sent jo Jonah. That's why he sent Jonah. And God already knew that they would not repent if he sent another prophet. That's why another prophet in person. That's why he didn't send another prophet in person. God already knew that there was nothing else that he could do to win them and redeem them back to him. That's why he, he pronounced complete destruction upon them. It's the same with hell. You know, ask yourself this question. If hell is not a reality, then what did Jesus come to say? You know, people don't believe in hell. Did you know that um, in a recent poll, less than 50% of people believe that there's a such a, there is an actual thing, uh, a place called hell that individuals will go to, human beings. Less than 50% of Americans believe that hell is a real thing. And so I ask yourself this question, if hell is not a reality, then what did Jesus come to save us from? <laughs> and and if he didn't come to say, Jesus said very clearly, I've come not to call the righteous, but sinners. If he's coming here to save sinners, what is he coming to save us from? Not just the brokenness of this world, but other, utter destruction. But here's a question. Why did God even send Jonah in the first place then? If he, if he knew that, they, that their repentance probably wasn't that genuine anyway, and that only a couple of decades later, they were going to stop their, their experience of repentance, and, and that after only a few more decades, he would destroy them anyway. Why did he even send Jonah in the first place? Why not just save, save Jonah's breath? Why send Jonah into the whale and all of that stuff? Well, the reality is, is that God knows that everybody 
has value and everybody deserves to hear a message. Everybody, everybody has the right to know that judgment is coming. The reality is that, that God knows that not everybody will respond. Not everybody's going to say, yes, Lord, and turn to him. But everybody deserves the right to know the truth and deserves to know the right that here is justice, here is judgment, and it is coming. God had to give an invitation. It wouldn't be fair for God to say, you guys don't get righteousness. You're just terrible. You're out there. Do whatever you want. You're lost anyway. That's not God's method. That's not God's way. What he says is he says, I love everyone. I want them to be saved. And so he sends someone lovingly that will woo them back to him. Although Jonah wasn't very wooing in his ways. The reality is that if you all knew that you were going to die in 40 days, just about all of us would repent too. But God had to be able to decipher the difference between true repentance and false repentance. And that took the work of time. That took the work of time. The work of grace, the work of reaching hearts, and the work of conversion, it's a, it's a lengthy experience. <laughs> it's not something that you can just wrap up in a day. It takes time for people's character to be truly seen. It takes time for God to, to not only for him to see it because he knows the future, but for our own wicked hearts to see our own character. To, for us to reveal who we are to the universe. The work of God in saving souls is very time-consuming. There was uh, a man named Golfer Payne Stewart, and um, he was a, a jet pilot, and there was a, a plane that was on autopilot flying at 30,000 feet, and it passed its destination. And so they sent some jets up there to see what's going on. Plane is flying at 30,000 feet. There's no movement in the cockpit. All they could figure out is that somehow uh, air leaked in and they asphyxiated and they died. And the plane is just cruising on autopilot. There's two fighter pilots, there two fighter pilot jets, they're 50 feet from the plane, but they can do nothing. They can do nothing to help. There's no process by which you can, you know, uh, lower a pilot into the plane while it's moving. And so they are thinking about the people on the board. They don't know if the rest of the people on board have already asphyxiated and everybody's dead or if there's people who are still conscious and, and know what's going on and there's nothing they can do. And so this man is describing this, the fighter jet is describing this moment of utter helplessness as he watches the plane as all it can do is simply run out of fuel and crash. But the reality is that Earth itself is in that plane. Earth itself is all on, this, on this, this inevitable destiny with death. The reality is that all of us, if not for the sake of God, have nowhere to go but down. And even God himself frequently and at times has his own hands tied behind his back. Why? Because he won't force our will. He will not force us to love him. He will not force us to obey. He will not make us turn to him. And so God, at times, is in the fighter jet watching the plane, knowing that soon it's going to run out of gas, and that'll be it. It's not easy to be God. It's not easy be, to be the one that's watching and waiting, <laughs> saying, is there anybody else? Last call. Please come to me. At times, all God can do is watch and wait. And that brings to mind really the reality of this concept called the close of probation. In reality, all of us are in this probationary moment where we have the opportunity to change, right? We can either, by God's grace, turn from wickedness and turn to him, repent and live, or we can actually end up going the other way, leave God, turn our back on him, and 
and leave God, Christ. That's, that's probation. We have this time period where we're allowed to make a decision of where we're heading from here. But the truth is that at some point, probation has to close. There has to be an end. The plane does run out of gas eventually. In Psalms chapter 50, verse 3 and 4, it talks about how God finally has to break the silence. It says, our God comes, and he does not keep silence. Silence. Before him is a devouring fire, and around him is a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Eventually, God breaks the silence and says, okay, this is it. Though God is patient and so frequently unable to do anything because he cannot make us obey, Eventually, he steps in and brings an end. He breaks the silence and he comes back in glory. At the second coming, he is a consuming fire. And he will bring resolutions. Some will have joy and others not so much. You know, I think what's broken in our society frequently is the fact that People no longer fear God. People fear all kinds of things. In fact, it's interesting how anxiety is on the rise. People fear all kinds of things. Misophobia is the fear of dirt. Hydrophobia is the fear of water. Niclophobia is the fear of darkness. Acrophobia is the fear of heights. Taxophobia is the fear of being buried alive. Xenophobia is the fear of strangers. Necrophobia is the fear of the dead. Claustrophobia is the fear of confined places. And I can't even pronounce this one. Triskidekaphobia is the fear of the number 13. <clears throat> People fear all kinds of things. But one thing that is greatly lacking in our society is the fear of God. People have forgotten to fear that one thing that needs fear. And that is what makes necessary the wrath of God. <laughs> it is God's wrath that, that demands the realization that we are not in control, <laughs> that we are not the final say in this planet. In Nahum chapter 1, verse 2, the Lord describes his wrath. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. He says, the Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. But it's interesting. Read the very next verse. So verse 2 is all about God's wrath. Read verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in a whirlwind and a storm. The clouds are the dust of his feet. It's interesting. Verse 2 says, the Lord is wrathful and vengeful. Verse 3 says, the Lord is slow to anger. Now, check it out. It happens again. Verse 6. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken into pieces. But look at the very next verse. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. So which one is it? What is the character of God? You, you begin to wonder, is, is his character full of wrath and anger? Or is, his ra or is his character full of love and peace? Which one is it? <laughs> yeah, it depends, Kirk is saying. The reality is it does depend. It depends on, on us. <laughs> what we see in God, what we experience from God, de is dependent upon how we choose to relate towards that God. Again, the parenting illustration is the one that makes it all clear. If your child is belligerently disobedient, offensively rude, and disgraceful, that child is going to experience your wrath, I hope. And if the child is loving, compliant, obedient, and gentle, then by God's grace, I sure hope that child experiences the love, protection, and care that they deserve. But it's hard for us to imagine this because, because, you know, 
usually for us, wrath and love don't get mingled exactly in that way because our wrath is broken wrath. Our wrath is human wrath. And so oftentimes, when we punish, we do punish in anger. It's hard to experience the wrath of, of Christ where we, where we punish in love. That, that's something that is not very evident in this world. And yet, God's wrath is a wrath of love. Always does God punish in love. Let me, let me explain it to you this way. If somebody murdered your child, would you have wrath? Would you have anger? And would you desire vengeance? You bet you would. You bet you would, because God himself, when his children are utterly abused, maligned, and, 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 and murdered, God has wrath. And what is the basis of his wrath? It's wrath against those who destroy his people. But notice, what is the context of wrath? The wrath is because of love. <laughs> if there wasn't love for his people, then there wouldn't be wrath and love and, and desire to protect them. So God's wrath is always a wrath of love. The problem is, we hate the idea that God has wrath because we struggle to experience wrath as God does. We, we struggle to see wrath in the light of godly wrath. We only see wrath in the light of human wrath. And that's why we don't like it that God has wrath. And that's why you rarely hear a sermon about the wrath of God. But if we, were, if we step back enough to see that God's wrath is a wrath of love, we wouldn't be afraid of a sermon on wrath. It is the intense love of God that creates wrath. Let's look at a few pa passages that describe the character of God's wrath. In Psalms 145, verse 8 and 9, it says, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Notice, it doesn't just say that his mercy is over his covenant people, or his mercy is over those who who obey him, it says that his love is to all. That means that his love is to those who experience his wrath. And that even in his wrath, there is mercy. <laughs> How so, you may ask? I don't get it. How can there be mercy and wrath? Some people say. Because, again, we're confused about what wrath is. The wrath of God versus the wrath of humanity. Think about this for a second. God did destroy Nineveh, but he gave them a 150-year warning. God did destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but how many centuries did he wait? God did destroy the world with a worldwide flood, but how many hundreds of years were they given warnings? God did destroy the inhabitants of Canaan after 400 years of warning. God did destroy Israel and Judah after and he broke his covenant with them after how many centuries? It wasn't like God just woke up one day and said, I'm tired of them. Done. In each case, God waited not minutes, not seconds, not days, not months. We're talking centuries of God's patience. Centuries. More than any of us will probably ever live. We don't comprehend the wrath of God because we can't even live long enough to understand the wrath of God. God's wrath is a wrath of love. And speaking of the destruction of God's people, God says, for the Lord will rise up on Mount Perizim, as in the valley of Gibeon, he will be roused to do his deed. Strange is his deed. And to do his work, alien is his work. God says that the destruction of the wicked is not something that is normal to him. What is normal to him is love, patience, peace, forbearance. But eventually, something has to give. And God says, this is weird, it is uncomfortable, it is strange, it is not normal behavior for God. The work of destruction, the worth of wrath, it is alien to God and yet he does it. Why? 
I, I would like to suggest the reason why is not because people need punitive punishment, but rather the reason is because God is putting them out of their misery. He knows they're lost already anyway. Why, why allow them to go on in misery longer? I, when we lived in um, Nebraska, we bought a house and we didn't know that we also bought some cats along with it. <laughs> the owner didn't happen to tell us that we were inheriting barn cats. I guess they just assumed that we wanted them. We didn't really, um, but they were there and they were at the door begging for food. <laughs> so out of uh, pity, we fed them. Uh, even though Raluca is not the biggest fan of cats, she's really scared of cats, actually. Um, and uh, so I was the one that had to deal with the cats. And when one of them got pregnant and had a litter of kittens, I was the one that had to go figure out, you know, how to manage them. Well, unfortunately, one day whenever I was outside trying to manage the kittens and feed the mother and all that stuff, there was like eight of them. They were crawling all over, and I was trying to keep them contained. And somehow, it's horrible to think of it, but I turned around and I stepped on one. And I heard all kinds of bones crush. I picked it up one day, I picked it up, and I knew for sure that the kitten was not gonna make it. Within a few minutes, its eyes were completely dilated, I tried to hold it and comfort it, it defecated on me, and I knew that it was going to pass. I was just gonna hold it and let it die, but it wouldn't. It wouldn't stop breathing. And so I did the most gracious thing. I shot it. <laughs> the, most, the most gracious thing that I could do for my kitten was to kill it. It was not going to survive. It had no hope of, there was no like, take it to a vet and see. I've been around animals long enough to know that one wasn't going to make it. And God's wrath is a wrath of just doing the most gracious thing that you can do with people that will not turn. God's wrath is simply the work of hell, <laughs> is simply the bringing to an end of a slow and painful misery. This is not something that God looks forward to. In Ezekiel chapter three, 33, verse 11, God mentions it. He says, Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But the wicked would turn from their way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Again, the call is going out to God's people, spiritual Israel. Turn, <laughs> turn to me. I want, to, I want you to live. I want you to live. In the end, God will have to put some out of their misery. In the end, he will have to remove evil from the universe. That will involve the removal of human beings and angels alike. Not because God wants to, not because God looks forward to it, but because that is the most gracious thing that God can do. In fact, the very best verse, and I'm going to end with this one, the very best verse in the book of Nahum is Nahum 1.9. It says, what do you plot against the Lord? For he will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise up a second time. You see, this is not actually a description of what's going on in Nineveh. This is a description of the final end of wickedness and evil in the universe. God promises that when he finally and fully does deal with sin, it's not coming back. Why? Because if, if, if ever a moment enters into somebody's mind, hey, maybe we ought to not obey, everybody will remember. No, we've done that one before. <laughs> and we know what happened. Death, destruction, and hurt. Nobody will be tempted anymore to go there. They'll all say, we've been there, we've done that, and it was not worth it. So my appeal is simple today. Stand in awe of God. Fear him. Fear his grace. Fear his glory. Love his mercy. But also stand in awe of his wrath. 
because that is very real. Although he doesn't enjoy that aspect of his character, it is something that God has to be for the sake of the universe and for the sake of final peace in the universe. Let us stand in honor of what God will do to make this place safe for us, finally. Amen? With that, let us stand as we sing our closing hymn. I want to draw attention actually to this song. I don't know this song, but the words are extremely poignant. Um, verse 2, it says, Lead on, O King Eternal, till sin's, fear, until sin's fierce war shall cease, and holiness shall whisper the sweet amen of peace. For not with swords loud clashing, nor roll of stirring drums, with deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. You know, we experience that right now, the, the clashing of swords and the drums and, and, and the experience of sin's war continuing. That's the, that's the experience that we're living in. But the final verse is, is the culmination. Lead on, O King Eternal. We follow not with fears, for gladness breaks like morning where'er thy face appears. Thy cross is lifted o'er us, we journey in its light. The crown awaits the conquest. Lead on, O God of might. A truth spoken in song. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Lord, if it were me, I would have given up already. <laughs> I would have washed my hands and, and given up on, on people. <laughs> But your grace just continues and continues. I, I praise you for your grace. You're so patient. You're so loving. You wait so long. Help us to have that type of grace as well too. Help us to have that love for the perishing. Give us a, a heart to seek and to save the lost like you. <clears throat>
Lord, we're still in the midst of this ugly battle, but we know that you are going to bring it to a close. I pray that not only us, not only our families, but everybody that we can reach will be on your side when that time comes. That we will be there as you're passing out the crowns. Lord, we know that before that time, or in the midst of that time, and after the millennium, you also will have to bring an end to sin. I know it's not easy for you, it's not easy to be God. But I thank you for doing what it takes to make a place of safety for us. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.